There are two works from the hand of Leonardo da Vinci in the Hermitage. He began that period of the Italian Renaissance, which was called, later, the High Renaissance. He was the first to combine his observations of nature with the most lofty ideals and generalizations. Madonna with a flower, Madonna Benoit, is the earliest of the surviving works of Leonardo. A notice on his drawing in the Uffizi gave the precise date, 1478. The chief impression this picture evokes is not its genre element, but the natural analysis of the inner world of a man, the awakening of consciousness in a child. The child is interesting himself in a flower, as if being in a normal, childish relationship with the world. The face of Mary, whose dress and hair are done in the latest Florentine fashion of that time, is marked by a placid smile. The natural gestures combine the characters into a unified group. For the first time in the art of the Renaissance, we see how convincingly the interplay of light and half-shadow creates the well-rounded forms, as well as filling the pictorial space with luminosity and airiness. The technique of oil painting, borrowed from the Netherlands, allowed the extreme elusiveness of the painted objects to be reached. Madonna and Child, Madonna Litta, was finished by Leonardo in Milan, where he moved in 1482. In the Madonna Litta, the perfection and harmony of bodily beauty and purely spiritual beauty is impressive. With its precise outlines, it recalls ancient marble pieces. All the elements, including the color scheme, are well balanced. This quite distinctive sculptural manner was characteristic of the Florentine school. The method of chiaroscura provides softness of all the volumes and facial features. The lips of Mary have just taken on a tender smile, so imperceptible are the light shadows in the corners of her mouth. Leonardo was capable of creating, by means of light and shade, not only volumes, but also the slightest emotions. The Hermitage paintings, The Holy Family, and Madonna Canestabile were executed by Raphael. He had no rivals in the ability to create such a number of true masterpieces. His talent was extremely fertile and capable of expressing the Renaissance achievement of his predecessors and contemporaries by means of such clear and harmonious forms that it was accepted as the model of perfection. Madonna Canestable ranks as one of the most early works of the master created in Perugia on the subject of the Madonna, for whose images he was famed. Raphael's imagery reveals itself to be faithful and placid. The clear purity of the dominant mood seems to be emphasized with a tender spring landscape of his native Umbria. The poetic mood and the aura of charming tenderness penetrate the images. In the treatment of the landscape background, Raphael followed closely the manner of his teacher Perugino. The lie, the line contributed to the feeling of the volumes. The painter loved to include his compositions in a circular frame, for he considered this form absolutely perfect and particularly pleasing to the viewer's eye. The original frame was apparently executed according to Raphael's own sketch. It was adorned with a great number of motifs, such as masks, griffins, garlands, and curls, which later played an important part in the decoration of Vatican loggias. While recalling a round window, an oculus, the frame can be considered as a window opened onto the surrounding charming world. The Holy Family was painted in Florence, where he improved his artistic education while working near Leonardo. Later, he moved to Rome to
to fulfill the grandiose pictorial ornamentation of the Vatican's rooms and created, parallel with Michelangelo, the best examples of monumental fresco painting of the High Renaissance. The Holy Family is a traditional composition with images of Mary, Joseph, and Child. The well-balanced composition, elaborated contours, and tender color endows the personages with a state of harmonious life as well as with loftiness and perfection. A purely Venetian feeling of life was reflected in the work of two of the greatest masters of the High Renaissance, Giorgione and Titian. As opposed to Florence, in the art of which the precise line, chiaroscuro, and the creation of volume were the main factors, the Venetian school distinguished itself primarily with color. Judith is one of the indisputable paintings from the hand of Giorgione. He used for his masterpiece a panel taken from a wardrobe. The Bible character, Judith, came to the enemy's camp and, having fascinated the Assyrian commander, cut off his head and thus saved her people. Giorgione rendered thus an idea of heroic deed in the image of a woman of ideal beauty. The lithe contours of the painting are charming, as well as its color scheme. It was the Venetian school where the change of color due to the interplay of light and shade was noticed for the first time. The Venetians also revealed that each shadow has its own color tone. The cloth of Judith is a splendid example of this. Titian's mastery in the rendering of the beautiful nude body is inimitable. His technique is really splendid and his colors are truly luminous. Various shades and subtle color accords distinguish the Hermitage picture Danahi. According to Greek mythology, King Akrais was foretold that he would die at the hand of his own grandson. So his daughter, Danahi, was imprisoned in a tower. But Zeus fell in love with her and took on the appearance of a golden shower of rain. The painter also emphasized the popular theme of people's ages in representing an old servant whose age contrasts with the youth of Danai, recalling the transience of time. The image of Magdalene, who repented of her sins and became a Christian, is in fact close to images taken by Titian from ancient mythology. The painter affirmed the earthly beauty and abundance of life's forces. Nevertheless, the world of clear harmony is penetrated with alarm which is reflected in the struggle between the cold and the luminous colors of this painting. The spontaneity and burst of emotions, as well as impressive freedom in the color handling, these qualities are indivisible in the artistic treatment of the painter. In the painting Saint Sebastian by Titian, the dominant mood is tragic. The brushwork itself seemingly reflects the pressing agitation only in the dolorous look of the young hero can we see no weakness. His personality was not broken by hard trials. He stands out in the darkness and chaos as an unsubdued man. Michelangelo created his marble statue, the Hunched Boy, during a complicated period of Italian history. In 1527, the troops of the Emperor Carl V plundered Rome. The subdued Pope Clement VII, descended from the Medici family, formed an alliance with the conqueror in order to struggle against Florence. Michelangelo took an active part in the defense of his native town but in 1530, Florence was captured. 
Michelangelo, with his Republican convictions, had to hide himself in one of the Florentine churches until an order from the Roman Pope came to direct the master to Rome to fulfill a new commission. It was supposed that during this hiding, Michelangelo executed a small sculpture, Form Itself. Several such figurines were planned for the tomb of the Medicis in their chapel, but the work was stopped due to the siege of Florence, and they were left out of the final version. The statue was carved from a piece of marble, and the rough surface retains traces of the sculptor's chisel work. The boy's body, in the hunched boy, is full of potential force, but unfortunately pressed as if subdued. We can feel the strengthening of the tragic world outlook inherent in the sculptor. The face of Mary, whose dress and hair are done in the latest Florentine fashion of that time, is imbued with a placid smile. We also smile looking at the child, who is interested in a flower, as if being ordinarily childishly acquainted with the world. The painter found many versatile shades in the interplay of light and half-shadow, searching for well-rounded forms, as well as for luminosity and airiness of pictorial space. It seems that we have just attracted the attention of the child. He seemingly looks at us sidelong, and the lips of Mary have just taken on a tender smile. So imperceptible are the light shadows in the corners of her mouth. Leonardo displayed how to build, by means of chiaroscuro, not only the volumes, but also the slightest emotions, as if they were woven of the tonal shades. Extreme subtlety was characteristic of Sienese art. The decorative art of Majolica was also renowned for its subtle execution and beautiful motifs. This dish attracted attention at both World Fairs of 1865 and 1878 in Paris. The dish, The Abduction of Helen, was executed in Castel Durante for the Duke and Duchess of Mantua, Francesco Gonzaga and Isabella d'Este. In the center we can see the arms of this noble family as well as a motto, No Hope, No Fear. The painting of this dish was made after engravings by Marco Dante and Marcantonio Raimondi. These engravers worked from Raphael's creations on the same subject. All the figures and the deep in space were handled very skillfully. It is described in the Bible that Judith came to the enemy's camp and, having fascinated the Assyrian commander, cut off his head, saving her people. Giorgione did not represent her feet. Rather, he turned to the rendering of the idea of the heroic deed embodied in the image of a woman of ideal beauty.
The physical and spiritual beauty of the represented youth is accentuated by all artistic means. The book in his hand and the architectural background, including a statue of Venus, signify that he is absorbed with the arts and sciences. In the right corner of the painting, we see a medallion with a roe deer. This serves as an artist's signature, whose name in Latin means a leaping roe deer. The Latin inscription near it indicates the date of the artist's age. He created the painting at the age of 25. The print was executed in the technique of chiaroscuro, the interplay of several close shades instead of a combination of different colors suggests an illusion of relief volume and mobile color surface. The forms of marriage chess became more complicated in the 16th century. A lid with such figurative decoration was not intended to be sat on like a bench. Such a chest was an object of the owner's pride, for it showed not only his wealth, but his education. The carved reliefs of nutwood here represent episodes taken from Julius Caesar's life. The lively handling of volumes and of the depth beneath them confirm that applied art followed the main trend of Renaissance art. This portrait of a beauty with a miraculous smile and sideways look reminds us of the famous portrait painted by Leonardo da Vinci, though this work of Correggio was not made under its direct influence. The woman is dressed as a widow in black. The laurel tree signifies her love for poetry, and a Latin inscription on the bowl is taken from Homer's poem, The Odyssey. A Latin word, late, on the trunk is the equivalent of an Italian allegri, this serves as the artist's signature, though he was better known, named after his birthplace, Correggio. The court of Duke Gonzaga in Urbino was renowned for its refined taste as well as the good education of its ruler Saint Courtiers. Such an image of a clever, educated, and outwardly restrained woman can be seen in this delicately reasoned portrait. Originally, the sculptor intended to include this statue in a composition on the tomb of the Medicis, but removed the statue from the final version. We almost physically perceive the tension concentrated in the figure, as if it is trying to release itself from the stone block. The rough surface retained traces of the sculptor's chisel work.
This masterpiece is one of the earliest in the work of Raphael. It was with his sublime images of the Madonna that he became so renowned. Raphael's imagery is faithful and placid, and the clear purity of the dominant mood seems to be emphasized by the tender spring landscape of his native Umbria. The well-balanced composition, clear outlines, and the reasoned color scheme impart an impression of harmonious inner and outer life. The images take on a fine and sublime character. A rare example of a painting of a real historical event, Sacco di Roma, when Rome was captured by the troops of Emperor Carl V in 1527, is confirmed by the inscription on the reverse. The dissolute Rome having been cut in two by the pious Carl V. It concerns certainly the habits of the papal court rather than the city of Rome. Noisy orgies like those of the Romans of the decadent age brought notoriety to the papal Rome of that time. According to Greek mythology, King Acris was foretold that he would die at the hand of his own grandson, so his daughter Danae was imprisoned in a tower but Zeus fell in love with her and took on the appearance of a golden shower of rain. The artist also accentuated in this painting a popular motif of that period. The theme of people's ages is represented by an old servant whose age contrasts with the youth of Danae, reminding us of the transience of time. The Book of the Holy Scriptures, which towers over the skull in the foreground of the painting, causes one to consider the vain and chaste life. However, it is not the austere aspect which is accentuated, but the sensuous one, typical of the Venetian approach. The terrestrial beauty of Magdalene, her eyes full of tears and her exalted gesture add to the emotion of the painting. The strictly controlled design is abandoned for the sake of spontaneity. Rich color and numerous tints are stressed. A tragic mood dominated the late works of the artist. The figure of a martyr stands out from the darkness and chaos in which the surrounding world is enveloped. Titian's pictorial surface recalls the temperamental storm of the brush strokes, partly penetrated with color clots of the subtlest shades. By the mid-1520s, 
Many works of Italian painting and sculptor demonstrated the bitter loss of the lofty ideals of the early 16th century. The experience of building the linear structure and composition could not endow their works with living emotions. The dominant color scheme was cold. Proportions became elongated and tense exaltation became more noticeable. It was not rare that lofty ideals made way for an erotic element. This trend was called, following its characteristic by Giorgio Vasari, mannerism. The Holy Family with St. Elizabeth and St. John the Baptist by Francesco Primaticcio is probably the most subtle of all mannerist works in the Hermitage. Its exquisite grace reminds us that the author would become one of the leading figures of the school of Fontainebleau. The tense color palette is in fact beautiful, but the cold light, bending and twisting figurative forms and whimsicality of the architecture create a feeling of anxiety, characteristic of mannerist art. The work of Veronese and that of Tintoretto recall the last rays of the setting sun. Italy knew other culminations of its artistic development, but these were outside the chronological period of the Renaissance. Lamentation impresses us with the restrained intensity of its emotions. In the work of Veronese, there is a group of paintings unified with their tragic character, as opposed to other works of this master penetrated with the joy of life. A riot of color rich in shades is characteristic of the Venetian school of painting. The composition is well balanced and softly confined. The theme of life and death thus received particular majestic sublimity in this picture by Veronese. This canvas stands out in the work of Veronese by its mood, as well as among other versions of the same subject through the mastery of its execution. In the earlier pictures by Tintoretto, such as the Hermitage's The Nativity of John the Baptist, rich color shades play a dominant role. This painting was executed at the same time as the Danae was painted by Titian. It displays the same Venetian love for voluptuous female beauty and a riot of color. But the figures are elongated and bent toward the viewers which evokes a feeling of unease and uncertainty. Only this feature differs from the classical traditions of high Renaissance art. This small-scale painting can be considered perhaps the most refined work of mannerism painting in the Hermitage collection. Its exquisite grace reminds us that Primaticcio was one of the leaders of the school of Fontainebleau. His skill in the dramatic handling of color with a combination of cold hues as well as his absorption with contorted figural forms and fantastic architectural motifs suggest the uneasy imagery characteristic of mannerism. The theme of life and death received particular majestic sublimity in this painting. The composition is well balanced and softly confined. The riot of color is rich in shades characteristic of the Venetian school of painting. 
This canvas stands out in the work of the Veronese by its mood, as well as among other versions of the same subject, through the mastery of execution. This glass jug with filigreed ornament is the most beautiful object in the Hermitage collection. Twisted white glass threads are included in a transparent glass mass. Such a net ornament was formed of two glass layers where white threads were led in different directions. A relief composition executed in Renaissance traditions adorns the sword. The subject is taken from the Roman legend about the Vestal Tusque, the Bergenet cask, medieval Burgundian helmet, in the form of a monster head, is executed in the Mannerist traditions. It belonged to Guido Baldo II, Duke of Urbino. The oversleeve with a glove is part of the armor of Philippe II, King of Spain, which is now in Madrid. All the objects are impressive in their technical perfection and artistic ingenuity. They are parts of ceremonial armor. The painting is from the same period as the Danae of Titian, and displays the same Venetian love for voluptuous female beauty and riot of color. But the figures are elongated and bent toward the viewers, which evokes a feeling of unease and uncertainty. Only this feature is different from the classical traditions of high Renaissance art. Caravaggio, as opposed to the brothers Caracci, affirmed the value of actual reality without any idealization on the part of the painter from the very beginning of his artistic career. His paintings on sacred subjects evoked bitter conflicts, for they did not suggest traditional piety. The personages he boldly introduced into his compositions were taken from life and they were not distinguished by any idealized beauty. Nevertheless, his paintings are not true copies of nature. In the painting Youth with a Flute by Caravaggio, we can see the common Italian motif of playing on a lute. There is a splendid still life piece on the table. One can almost smell the flowers, so precisely are they handled, and the fruits rendered with great faithfulness. The musical instruments are depicted so precisely that we can almost hear the melody. This still life piece is, in fact, an allegory of the five human senses. And the broken string of the violin ought to remind us of the transience of all earthly things. The face of the musician is not distinguished by the canons of classical proportions, it even has some female features, as a result of which this image was earlier indicated as a woman in the Russian title of the painting. In this rather early work, Caravaggio could attain particular expressiveness thanks to his original handling of chiaroscuro principles. Sharp contrasts of light and shade punctuate the most meaningful details. 
These formulas were widely used by the successors of Caravaggio. Venice, which ranked in earlier times as the Queen of the Adriatic, was by the 18th century famous primarily for its great artists. The best musicians, such as Vivaldi, Cimarosa, Gluck, Mozart, and other great composers worked there. In Venetian theaters, the brilliant companies under Goldoni and Gozzi found their fame. It would be difficult to imagine Venetian painting of the 18th century without music and theater. In a painting not so large in scale, Mycenas presenting the arts to Augustus, painted by the greatest Venetian master of that time, Giovanni Battista Diopolo, we can see a splendid scene which was arranged like some sumptuous theatrical performance. The laws of the theater are dominant here. The composition is well balanced rendering precisely all the relations between the characters. In the distant view, seen through an arch of the majestic architectural background, one can enjoy a pleasant landscape as if it functions as a theater backdrop. The Roman statesman Mycenas, whose name became a common noun, appears here as a patron of the liberal arts, to wit painting, sculpture, and architecture. Poetry is embodied in the image of blind old Homer. It's as if joyful music is playing in the luminous color scheme characteristic of Diapolo. The distant silver-blue haze creates a most subtle color harmony. Diapolo was an outstanding master of virtuous decorative painting, and his compositions were probably influenced by real feasts, which often took place in Venice on the place of San Marco, near the palace of the Doges. The town landscapes painted by Antonio Canali were also reminiscent of these feasts and public ceremonies. He reconstructed the scenery in its full reality of the town's appearance and the people's costumes and masks, for the latter were worn in Venice not only during carnivals, but also at ceremonies. These portraits of Venice were painted in the studio on the base of various sketches. The painters did not yet work en plein air. But we can feel here the particular southern light and humid sea atmosphere which softened the bright colors of the feast clothes as it was treated in the painting The Reception of the French Ambassador in Venice. The image of Venice of the 18th century would not be complete without townscapes from the hand of Francesco Gardi. He happened to show us that Venice existed not only with feasts, but in common everyday life. In Gardi's paintings, documentary faithfulness made way for a poetical image of this town. One could call Gardi's landscapes impression landscapes, in which soft, diffused light creates a particular charming aura. This painter was capable of revealing and depicting narrow, calm streets, which are separate from the festive life of Venice, and he opened thus the poetic character of this town for future generations. An obedient material, so-called terracotta, takes on forms now of the violently twisted drapery folds, now of the clouds, now of the passionate emotion of Teresa, in whose vision an angel appears who pierces her heart with a golden arrow tipped with fire. Unfortunately, the angel's head and hand did not survive in the Hermitage sculptural study. Bernini took pride in his ability to make marble appear as soft as wax. The complicated forms he chose for his composition also made his work difficult to execute in pliable clay.
The landscape views of Guardi are dedicated to the quiet, narrow streets of Venice, which are situated away from the ceremonial fussiness of the places of Venetian public life. Documentary exactness gives way to a poetic image of the city. This is a type of mood landscape, and the soft, diffused light imparts a particular unforgettable charm to such landscapes. Canaletto ranks as one of the greatest masters of Veduta, the town landscape which flourished in the 18th century, primarily in Venice. The event represented took place in 1726. The artist reconstructed all the scenery in its complete actuality, with gondolas, red clothes and wigs, the noisy crowd of spectators, and certainly the masks. He rendered exactly the architectural peculiarities of the famous edifices, the Palace of the Doges, the Lorenziana, the Church of Santa Maria della Salute, and took into consideration the character of the hazy Venetian light. With all his work, Caravaggio affirmed the superiority of realistic rather than idealistic pictorial context. Nevertheless, his paintings are not two copies of nature. Looking at the objects near the youth, the contemporaries of Caravaggio could easily comprehend such a representation as an allegory of love. But the faithfully observed still life could be understood as an allegory of the five senses, there were also other interpretations. The face of the musician does not distinguish itself with the canons of classical proportions. It even has some female features. As a result, in the Russian title of the painting, this image was identified earlier as a woman. The traditional scene is represented where the women are informed by the angel of the resurrection of Christ. The distinctively modeled figures, the relief-like composition, punctuated with an emphasis of pathetic gestures, rigid outlines, and local patches of color. All these features met the demands of the classical doctrine. Such doctrine was worked out by the Karachi brothers in the Bolognese Academy in order to catch up with the artistic formulas of the masters of the High Renaissance. Crespi departed early from the formulas of Bolognian academism. He was interested more in the versatile play of light and shadow. His brown color scheme, full of subtle shades, received more life due to twinkling light splashes. The aerial surround in his paintings seemed to be an active personage which made the slightest scenes of everyday life important and deserving of attention. Magnosco turned to the surrounding life for his subjects, which he imparted with a great sense of unease. His tragic mind took on a form of grotesque and exaggerated imagery. He often chose a cold palette, 
while the pictorial space was imbued with the imperceptible travel of shadows. His rapid brushwork, with irregular and movable strokes, suggested the feeling of persistent movement. The art of Salvatore Rosa was very versatile. It reflected the uneasy life of the artist himself, his wild temperament, his inherent sense of humor, as well as his talent as an actor. There is an element of costuming also in this portrait piece. Someone is apparently playing here the role of a bandit, possibly the artist himself. Tiepolo was an outstanding master of virtuous decorative painting. Luminous colors were characteristic of him, and he had an innate faculty for representing all events like a theater setting with sumptuous scenery. The Roman statesman, Masonus, appears here as a patron of the liberal arts, painting, sculpture, architecture. Poetry is embodied in the image of blind old Homer. This allegorical painting was commissioned by the Count Algarotti, who was engaged in collecting a painting gallery for the omnipotent minister of the Saxon ruler, August III, Count Bruhl. The subject is unknown to this day, though many suppositions have been made. The painter obviously emphasized the dignity and noble spirituality of this image. It is supposed that we deal here with Tristano Martinelli, the brilliant interpreter of the harlequin role in the theater of Commedia dell'arte, where the actual miming is hidden behind a mask, and the soul under the mask is as fire under ashes, Goldoni. In the second half of the 18th century, there appeared a new artistic trend in Rome, that of neoclassicism. It reflected a new wave of interest in ancient culture, which spread through many European countries. Roman neoclassicism took superficial artistic formulas from the ancients, and the classic purity of form was tinted now by sentimentality now by the erotic connotations of the surviving Rococo style. The most famous sculptor of the late 18th, early 19th century, Antonio Canova, lived and worked in Rome. He acted as dictator of artistic tastes, and his imagery soon was praised as a model of beauty. He was invited to France by Napoleon, and to Russia by Catherine II and Alexander I. Canova refused the trip to Russia, but the Russian ambassador, Count Yusupov, returned to St. Petersburg with his statuary, Amour and Psyche, which was the author's variant of the statue in the Louvre. According to legend, the goddess Venus took a dislike to Psyche because of her beauty, and arranged an eternal sleep for her. Amour returned her to life with a kiss. Canova sought to achieve the classical harmony of proportions and fluid outlines, but these formulas often took on a gracious and coddled form in his work. Mm -hmm. 